שירוק מכסה, והמרחב נפתח בעיניה, עיניה נפתח לשמיש. Transmits or actually translates that music and directs it. This is what we found in Mirna. And when she told me a bit about the mission of Phoenix, I was very impressed. And I'm very happy to have her here again now. She was born in Rio de Janeiro. She's Brazilian. She's a Brazilian Israeli. So she actually also made her Aliyah. Yes. Do you remember how many years ago? It will be 30. 30 years ago, so it's been a quite some time. Her husband is also here with us, and we're very happy to have you. He's also a wonderful musician, and so a very talented uh, family. She is a player of what they call the viola, or the... No, da viola da gamba. Okay, you know, viola. she should actually be explaining this. What am I doing? I'm not a, I'm not a uh, string player. I'm a woodwind. I'm a wood, <laughs> wood player. But uh, she is a performer and a conductor, and she also does academic research. Her articles appear in a lot of uh, journals, very important journals and books. And one of the things I wanted to point out is if you can please look at her website. She has some wonderful concerts coming up. They're definitely worthwhile attending. And I have to read this part. In Brazil, she's one of the biggest names of the viola de gamba in Brazil. So this is a, this is a very important person we have with us, and I'm, I'm delighted that she has a chance to share with us her testimony as well about how a woman musician has been able to transmit hope in times of, her, of crisis in families, small crises, bigger crises. But I hope you enjoy what she has to share with us tonight. And if you do have any questions, she is a passionate musician, and so she can answer any of those questions you may have. So, welcome, Mirna. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very can fast. you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kathleen. It's a, it's a honor and a privilege to be here, and I thank you very much for the opportunity. Actually, when Kathleen uh, invited me to do this talk, I started to put together some thoughts, and this is like it's like a trip in circles that I will go and it, I, it will seem that I will go away, but then I come back to, and it's about music, hope, and being a woman conductor. So um, I would like to start uh, saying that we uh, humans, by definition, we are lonely. We're born alone and we will die alone. And as much as we gather and socialize, etc., we, differently from all animals, we are aware of the finitude of our lives, which makes us very different in the animal kingdom. And because we feel alone, we know we actually are alone, we love to communicate. And therefore, Social media is thriving, and everything that has to do with us communicating with, with each other to feel less lonely, that's the point. This is a, it goes very well. And music might have been created for us humans as a way to communicate with each other as well as express emotions. Because music creates emotions. And the emotions that music awakes within us makes us have the feeling that someone hears us, that we are understood. And therefore, music is something that touches us so deeply. And when we hear music and, and emotions are, arise, it's like, wow. Someone understands us. We actually, we are not alone. And this is the great power of music. So music communicates and speaks to us in a very basic and direct level, emotions. 
something that precede words. This is the closest thing to our first communications with our mothers, which those communications were also made via emotion and not via words. So, uh, as a conductor, I see that part of my job is to look at the music and try to understand what emotions the composer embedded in his musical text and how he did so. So I need to analyze the music and see how the guy did that and how I'm going to bring those emotions out. So I feel, honestly speaking, I feel like a servant. I serve the composer. And I, I also uh, try to understand all the messages he left in the music, which are like technical messages like uh, sometimes allegro, presto, uh, the tempo, and so on. And, and uh, while some of my colleagues, it might be, it's quite amazing, many conductors just go over it and they don't want to know. No, I, th I feel like this is like a little message. You can call it a WhatsApp, the composer left, left me. Hey, Mirna, I want you to do this. So I go and try to find out what it is, because my work is to bring out all those emotions who are in the text. And I, my role is to give life to those emotions which are on the paper. Now, uh, I feel that this role of musical director or conductor is very appropriate to women, because uh, women have been for thousands of years in charge of the of their families, of the health of their families, of the welfare of their families. And women, uh, they need on the one hand to place very clear rules to the children, but on the other hand, they need to be flexible. They need to encourage growth. They need to encourage independence. While on, on the other hand, say, no, you cannot do that. Stay away from the Sheka, how do you say it, from the electric, <laughs> because you're going to... So you have to be very strict and very firm and have clear limits and in enable freedom. And I think this is exactly what a good conductor should do, in my opinion. Uh, so uh, think about that as a conductor. Tomorrow, I hope you will come to the Phoenix and the Madrigal Choir and Solvice and the concert, The Glory of Venice. I am the conductor. Wow, how important am I, right? Will I play any single note? No. <laughs> no. It's the others that are playing, right? So my, my instrument is the others. So uh, what is my task? I think what I try to do when as a woman conductor, is to bring the best, to bring out the best in each one of my colleagues, uh, uh, the musicians which I am directing. And uh, so I, th we have like a common um, a goal, which is that I need to bring out what the composer said, so I explain to them what is our goal. So on one hand, I'm very clear. People who work with me know very well. I said, this is our task. Look at the test. Look what it says. And I, I have a very precise goal. On the other hand, I encourage people to bring their own, uh, th their own personalities into that. Just to give you an example, uh, for instance, if I have, I, I always look at the text, especially when you have a, a, a written text that's very easy because the words are there. So if I have a text that is expressing, let's say, anger, so I have many times asked the singer, excuse me, where's your anger? I see you singing beautiful sounds, but what is the anger? The music is expressing anger or indignation or love or whatever. So where is this feeling? So give me your feeling. and. In the one hand, I'm very clear. On the other hand, uh, I open the door and say, show me. How do you feel that? And this is, for me, very fascinating work to do. So as, as a conductor, I also do two things. I encourage, a, I have a bond with each person of the group. I personally uh, address each one of them. I work separately with each singer sometimes. 
sometimes a lot of singers, uh, of the soloist singers, I, I work with them. Uh, first, on one-to-one -one basis, the new ones always say, well, why should I do that? I said, I, at the end, they say, wow, I understand. Because we create a bond and we, we do all the experiments and, and so on. And I also encourage them to create bonds with each other, especially the ones who are teams, like oboes and violins play the same line, call apart it's called, so they should work. Also the cello with the organ and so far. So it works very nice because they help each other and they function well as a team and they are independent for me. There's a problem, they bring it to me, but I, I find it a very pleasurable way to work and especially is a very good way to work because brings good results. And those results, uh, they have bearings in the other thing which I, I was telling Kathleen, I find it very important. I think it's a very woman thing also to put that in, in, to take this in consideration, is this factor which I call energy. My job is to take care of the energy of the group. So I want people who come to play with me to enjoy it, to have fun, to bring their best. So I need, I need to encourage that. I need to allow this. I need also to relate to them with a good energy. And many times I, I, uh, I could like say, I, many times I need to substitute people, you know, uh, uh, and if I need a, to bring, bring a new player in, I always ask what is this energy of this person? Because some people come with the bad energy, very competitive, very, so I know it's not going to work, it's going to spoil the energy of the whole group. So it may be Paganini in the violin, I say, no, I don't need it. I need people who will come with their hearts. So I think if you will come to the concert, you will feel that to, tomorrow. And I think this is one of the things I am most personally proud, I can say, of Ensemble Phoenix, maybe. <laughs> One can have many criticisms. I always have many criticisms, by the way. But this is a great thing that people go for it with full energy. And everyone who is in the public, I think, f does feel it. And I think this is a very feminine thing also because women do not compete within their families. Like for a woman, the success of her family uh, is, is her success the success of her team. So I work with my team and for me each uh, singer is a star I want to shine. So if I see the minimum problem uh, like some the range is not good, I go, I learn how to write music in the computer for that to be able to transpose so that singers can be comfortable and then they can shine. And then I can have present a nice program and only this is worthwhile doing otherwise I should do something else. Right? Uh, now, my, as I said, now, I, I seem that I'm going in circles, but I will go back. How this connects with the uh, hope in times of crisis, right? I, all, all this. Well, let's go back to the beginning. When a new baby is born, he is like a new immigrant, Ole Hadash. He doesn't speak the language, he does not know the place, uh, everything is unknown and hostile. Uh, for a baby, the only thing that sustains him and gives him hope is his mother's communication with him, which is done uh, also through music. First of all, for the little baby, just hearing the voice of the mother immediately calms the baby. I remember when my first son was born and I, I, people uh, came, came carrying him and he was uh, shouting. The moment he heard my voice, stop. It's like music and also because mothers sing to their children. So hearing music is, is a very, very basic thing. And, uh, and this communication with the mother is, is something very soothing for, for the baby. And it gives the, the baby this feeling that he is not alone and that he can 
face this threatening new world because he has his mother beside him. And this gives hope because when you are not alone, you can have hope. If you feel alone and everything is threatening and menacing, you have no hope. If you feel so, if someone is beside you, immediately you have hope. And what is this hope? The hope that the baby feels is that the hope to come back to this perfect world where he did not fear, or where he did not have hunger or thirst when he was inside uh, the mother's belly, and where he heard the mother's voice. In my case, I heard not only my mother's voice, I heard my mother playing the piano. And they had made all the difference in my life. So I don't know how I am of time. Catherine, can I? I'm okay, can I go? So I, I will, uh, I, I always say that in life, the big decisions that we take are not rational. They are totally led by the heart and by things that we don't know about ourselves. I mean, and no one marries because of uh, uh, intellectual considerations, and we don't have children because of that, and we do not choose our career. So all the important things we do have nothing to do with the uh, coldness, cold, uh, right? So in my case, I think many things were determined in my life by the fact that I heard my mother playing the piano always. and. What I remember when I was a kid that, wow, just hearing her play was, wow, amazing. And they, my family had a, a summer house uh, near Rio de Janeiro. And at this summer house, there was a piano in the living room. And my, my room went next to it. And my bed was next to a wall, which was the wall dividing this room from the living room. So when I went to bed at night, I could hear my, my, my mother playing the piano. This was like, you know, like the world was the most perfect place possible. And I said that it's probably this thing that you come, that one comes back to the, this perfect place. Uh, and when my mother died, uh, she had a, a very nice piano, Blutner, a uh, big piano. And well, this happened in Brazil. I was living in Israel, and I said, of course, I well, we'll have to sell the piano. And I came back to Israel, and I, uh, I had a person repairing a, a, an old instrument for me, and I saw this guy, he knew how to repair and take care of old pianos. So I, I looked at my husband, who thanks God he understands me, and I said, that's going to bring mom's piano here. And he said, yes. So I sent an SMS to my brothers, I'm staying with mom's piano, which is crazy because I'm a viola da gamba player, which is a string instrument and a cello player. Right? So, and my husband plays the violin, so it doesn't make any sense. But we brought the piano and we do concerts of piano at our home. We did before the corona. We invited piano players, so we, we charged entrances. All the money was for the players, just for the pleasure to hear this piano. So this is something totally not reasonable to do, but gave us great happiness. So see how, and uh, this piano is for me like, like a Pandora a Pandora box that when it plays, wow, my whole family emerges, even the dog and the parrot and my grandparents and everyone emerges from it. So uh, I, um, my family was quite peculiar because my father was a Holocaust survivor, Polish, who came to Brazil where he met my mother. Uh, and because his niece was a piano player and my mother played the piano again and my mother was catholic and uh, when they married uh, my mother made as a condition that the the kids were we educated in the catholic religion and so was i uh, and there was always christmas at my parents home and then i opted later on to become jewish like my father, 
And uh, at my home, I, we did not, my personal home, we did not celebrate Christmas. We, this was something always that happened at my parents' home. And last December, on Christmas Day, suddenly, I give me, I don't know how to say it in English, saudade, you, when you miss something. I miss so much, I said, wow. I, I still remember the Christmases as at my parents' house with my brothers, my grandparents, and so I went to the piano. And I started to play, I'm not a piano player, as you know, but I played and played, and then it was amazing. And then my husband, who was in his office, said, what were you listening to? Who was playing? <laughs> I said, I was playing. <laughs> Because it's amazing, this like something fell upon me, with the spirit of Christmas, and I entered into it via the piano. So you know, music is, is just to tell you something has nothing to do with my career, or it's just how it goes because because I heard it in the belly, and this is the place. So it's creates a direct channel of emotions. And this, again, gives us the feeling of being heard, of being understood. Of, for me, for instance, it gave me, it brought me back into my family, my original cell as a person. Now I would like to end saying, okay, uh, okay, for me personally, you can understand it. It gives me hope the moment that I feel fed by this original cell, which is my mother, right? So it gives me, the whole, be the world becomes a great place. But there is another aspect uh, which I want to end with, about how music inspires hope, and hope is the most necessary thing in terms of prizes. This is what keeps us going. Uh, I would like to quote an American composer named jo George Crumb, who died recently in February age 92, and in his words he says, music might be defined as a system of proportion in the service of a spiritual impulse. So in a, here it is someone speaking about spirituality connected to music. And I think that there is something and at the same time, I explain to you all explainable things, but there's something unexplainable about it. And many of us feel that music connects us with something beyond us and raises our soul to the divine. So I would like to end that saying that I think that music is like Jacob's ladder in Jacob's dream. I will call Genesis 28, 12. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway re resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above stood the Lord. So in this Jacob's ladder, music is bringing us to God and bringing down God to us. Thank you for having me in this most wonderful mystic place, Magdala. Thank you for your attention.